Welcome to the Empowered to Connect podcast, where we come together to discuss a healing-centered approach to engagement and well-being for ourselves, our families, and our communities. I'm J.D. Wilson, and I am your host. And today on the show, Becca McKay and Regina and Yasha uh, Shari join us from Zimbabwe to talk with us about how to meet needs. So today's connecting practice that we're talking about is meet needs, which does sound very trivial and simple. Um, but as you can guess by now, there's a lot of complexity to it. And so uh, we wanted to have Regina and Yasha specifically on to talk about this one because they have a firm grip on it. And so, um, and just through facilitator training and our conversations with them, all of that, um, they are killing it here. And so you'll get to hear all about their work in Zimbabwe, um, about uh, their personal journeys to connect to ETC, their family, and all of that. It's going to be great. Uh, you will love them. Uh, this is one of our favorite conversations in a long time. And so uh, without any further ado, here's Becca McKay, Regina and Yasha and myself talking about how to meet needs. Okay, well, as we talked about in the introduction, um, it is Becca McKay and Regina and Yasha Shari with us today um, from Zimbabwe. And so we are going to talk um, all about um, our connecting practice for the day, but we're also going to just get to know them. And so, guys, uh, first, obviously, thank you for making time and coming on. Um, I'll say before we oh, get started. Yeah, before we get started, why don't we just, um, you guys just tell us about yourselves and what you do, tell us about your family, and then how you got connected to ETC. Okay, um, so I'm Nyasha, and this is my wife, Regina, and we live in Arari, Zimbabwe. We've been living here since, goodness. Well, your whole life. My whole life, but I mean, <laughs> together. Uh, I've been in Zim 17 years. 17 years. We've been married now nine years in October. Mm -hmm. okay. 10 years in October. Is it? Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so obviously my math is a little off. Um, but we, we've been married since 2013 that I remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think almost, I think this program is pretty much the foundation of our marriage. Yeah. Because we did the training with Mike and Amy and, and I'm not sure which part of Texas that was. Irving. Irving, Texas. Um, and straight after the, the training, we drove to to, Mich to California to get married. Um, and this was part of, you know, I was just getting introduced to to the power in Power to Connect uh, with, through Mike and Amy, something that Regina had been working on for a long time. And I was new to it. And coming from my background, coming from Africa and hearing all these uh, concepts that people use to parent <laughs> with the parenting that I had experienced was very different. Yeah. And I think that kind of gave me a picture of sort of where we were going, how we were going to parent. Um, and, and I had to, I don't want to use the word compromise, but I think I had to realign myself in, in so many ways to think very differently on how we were going to do that. And I remember some of the examples that Mike used and try to picture myself in that, the the self sacrifice that you have to go through yeah. to to raise children, especially from hard places. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's a big deal. Um, and I, so when I say foundation of our marriage, I think that got me thinking before I said I do. <laughs> yeah. and I had the time to drive to California to really think about it where this was going. <laughs> uh, but um, so that's how we've been connected and I think our family our life our work is really um cemented in in connecting mm -hmm. with with little ones and trying to find the place that they had yeah I think that's really good it's such great memories of getting connected with empowered to connect from the very beginning but I moved to Zimbabwe in 2005 and I actually met our daughter, Ruth, before I met Nyasha. Oh, and, wow. and I had been um, called in to serve in a crisis in a children's home that she was living in and knew pretty quickly that our relationship was going to be different than it was with the other kids that I had worked with. But I didn't know how that was going to be possible. And then a couple of years later, met Nyasha and said, so here's the deal. There's this girl girl, we come together as a package deal. So you need to kind of figure that out before we go any further. Yeah. And um, 
And I'm really glad that he did. <laughs> I'm really glad that he did. But um, in those early days of working in Zim, and um, I'm, I'm a social worker, and I was working as a clinical social worker in the States before I moved to serve cross-culturally in Zim. And I actually reached out via email to Dr. Purvis at the Institute and was asking for help trying to figure out some things. Um, I did the same thing with Dr. Perry. I was just emailing randomly from internet cafes, anyone I could get in touch with. Because in my master's program in the early 2000s, we didn't talk about trauma. Right. It wasn't right. that that wasn't a part of the curriculum. And then all of a sudden I was serving children who had experienced immense amounts of trauma in communities where, you know, trauma healing practices were not spoken about. And we were trying to figure that out. And Dr. Purvis, you know, graciously emailed back and forth with me quite a lot um, about practices that I could use with Ruth and the other kids I was working with. And then um, I got my hands on a copy of The Connected Child on a trip, on an early trip back to the States. And I knew as soon as I possibly could that I wanted to do practitioner training. But it was years before that was in the mix. So we actually got married in between our um, Empowered to Connect, Train the Trainer, and my TBRI practitioner training in 2013. So we had six days off in between and we got married in California. That's awesome. Okay. So it goes back pretty far. Like you, <laughs> yeah. you guys are, are definitely ingrained. Um, what was, Yasha, what, what for you was the selling point? I mean, you mentioned like growing up very differently, not being parented this way as you were growing up. What, what was it that kind of sold you on these principles or sold you on kind of operating and parenting this way versus um, continuing on the way that you had been brought up yourself? I think it's it's it was more realizing that um, you know even if I turned out okay, there were things that I still carried yeah. that I'd never probably been shared and I'd never shared with anybody. And my upbringing, which I think most of the world who still don't understand trauma, will come from the perspective that trauma teaches you, not it shapes you. So a lot of people will think because you've had an an experience and it's traumatic, you should learn from it. Um, But I think, you know, this comes from the angle where it has shaped you. So the way that you are, who you are today has been shaped by that experience. So when you're older, people will look at you like, come on, you got to deal with this. Um, It happened years ago. It happened decades ago. Why is this still affecting you? So it was more understanding that I think that was the selling point for me to realize that a lot of people that we're still telling, get on with it, are still traumatized. And, you know, this would be helpful to to raise kids that way so that they understand that way. And they also teach the world that way. And I think from the platform that I have being being African, being in Zimbabwe and being able to to speak to my fellow mates to say, hey, guys, this is something that we got to work together and educate one another that. Trauma does shape who we become. Yeah. 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 Has that been, has that been well received so far? Has it been mixed? How how have you found that information taken there? I think it's growing uh, slowly, uh, just as the world goes. I think, you know, you, you get resistance. There's still people who want to live their life because they'll say, you look at me, I didn't turn out bad. Right. Um, right. You know, sometimes it takes pointing out things in their lives to say, well, that's not okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, look at how you're doing that. <laughs> so it's it's interesting. But I think as I've progressed and I've, you know, walked the journey more, I'm realizing that the struggle is a lot more uh, with men. Um, I think women generally tend to open a lot earlier yeah. and quicker. Yeah. With guys, it's it's almost like a new thing. It's like a new invention that I have to share my feelings. Right, right. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, okay, so we'll you know we're going through this summer talking about all of our connecting practices, right? So we're we're making our way through, and today Becca's going to introduce our connecting practice for the day. Yeah, we're super excited uh, to hear from our facilitators just their experience with these practices because I think when you just look at them in a list, you're like, oh yeah. Those are good 
statements. But then when you get to hear like, no, like in people's like living rooms and in their backyards and in their schools, like this stuff really matters. Yeah. So we're really excited today to talk about our practice of meeting needs, um, which sounds so basic, but it really is profound when you kind of like get into it. And so we have always three core components. And so for this practice, our first one is meet emotional needs. Like you're saying, it's like not everyone grew up in a space where it was okay to feel or where it was acceptable or where you knew what to do with your emotions. So we want to um, really meet kids' emotional needs. And then we want to meet physical needs. Uh, that's something that also, like, I think any parent is like, yeah, all I've been doing is feeding my kids ever like since they came into my life. Like all we do is what's for dinner, what's for snack, what's next, yes. what's next. But when you can really pause and think about all those physical needs that kids bring to the table and like what an opportunity opportunity it is to meet those. And that can help proactively just set them up for success and to be healthy. And it can also help in times of like stress and challenge on, on like a responsive mm -hmm. level. Um, and then lastly, there's a lot to unpack about meeting sensory processing needs. It's something that we're learning a lot about even to this day. The research is coming out more and more and we're just learning hey, we all experience the world slightly differently. <laughs> and so there's lots to think about, you know, if a kid is avoiding something or seeking something or running away from a loud sound or spinning in circles for hours. And so um, meeting sensory processing needs. And so obviously like meet needs, it sounds really simple. There's a ton yeah. to it and we won't get to talk about every single aspect today, but we're excited to hear from you guys how you've experienced this connecting practice in your own lives and in your work. Um, so it's kind of a, you know, kind of our first question is just like, what's your favorite thing about meeting needs? What do you like about it? How did it change maybe your mindset or anything like that? Do you want to go first? You, want me to you can go first. Yeah. All right. So my favorite thing about meeting needs, I mean, this might sound really cliche is that it works. Yeah. And my yeah. favorite thing about meeting needs is that it is, the fastest way to get the outcomes that I, as a parent want. Mm -hmm. That is just the truth. <laughs> I hear that. Yeah. <laughs> is that so often, you know, every parent that I talk to all of my girls, friends, parents, every single one of them is like looking for an outcome with behavioral change. Yeah. And we can try so many tactics and we exert so much energy and we exhaust ourselves trying to find ways to squash behaviors. And if we just look at the need behind the behavior and meet it, man, is it so much better for every single person involved? Yeah. 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 So do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think I think this one is an interesting one for me because, you know, sometimes putting words to things give them meaning. And when I look back in my life, I can see where my parents would meet my needs, but it was never a conversation that they were meeting my needs, obviously. Um, yeah. But I think it, now when I look back, I, I think those were processed in two ways. And one, the needs were met through fear. <laughs> mm, and yeah. then I think... The other one that the the needs were met by being told that I'm a good child. So it was either of the extremes. Um, and if if I had an issue that I needed to be a need that I needed to be met, and they didn't feel like it could be met because I've acted out, it would be met with with fear or punishment of some sort. Yeah. Um, so I think for me that's been the the most difficult one because it's now trying to dig out of a um, a pot that I don't have filled. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like yeah. learning things, then having to pass them on to my kids or the kids that I work with has been a process for me because as I'm doing that, I'm also working on myself. So I think it's, it's, it's probably my, my, my favorite mm. because it, it, it drives more out of me than, than any of the other ones, I think, because I have to dig deep. I, I'm glad to hear you say that. I mean, I've, I feel like one of the things that I had noticed the most about this particular practice is that I like, if I don't pay attention to it, I'm the right. one driving the dysregulated behavior. Like, yeah. uh, so if I don't pay attention to making sure that I'm eating and getting up and moving around and like taking care of like why, you know, trying to identify what's going on inside of me, if I'm, if I feel off in some way, then I take it out on everybody around me. Um, and yeah. so it's easier to spot that in kids. Now, 
spotting it versus uh, regularly meeting those before you spot the outcomes. Like that's the trick, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, that is that is so true. I think the other thing that I love about this is how it builds trust. So I am a child of trauma. You know, I I have come from a a family history of a lot of trauma. And so I am constantly having to watch myself. Number one, that I am meeting my own needs, you know, that I'm identifying and meeting my own needs because it doesn't come naturally for me, but also that I'm voicing my needs. You know, if I, if I need Yasha to help meet those or yeah. someone else. Um, and so I, I think what I, another thing that I love about this practice is that if I, live this out in my own life, that I'm teaching my girls through modeling that, that it's okay to voice my, that my needs, it's okay to ask for help getting my needs met. It's okay to expect that those needs will be met. Yeah. And the amount of trust definitely with our eldest daughter, who's adopted the amount of trust we have built, you know, over the years and years and years of relationship, just through meeting needs is priceless. Yeah. Yeah. That's you know, great. it it seems really hard to believe how much trust you can build with a snack at the beginning. And then, you know, a decade in, you look at it and you're like, oh, thank God for those snacks. Right. Yeah. Right. Now, oh, that's a great point. Um, well, you know, when I think as with a lot of these connecting practices, it's really easy for critics or people from the outside who aren't aren't familiar with all this to look at it and be like, oh kid acts out, you get him a snack. Are you crazy? Oh, like, yeah. That's not how we handled this. Like you're not rewarding bad behavior. So let's talk yeah. about some of those misconceptions. Like what, what do you think are the most common misconceptions or mistakes or, or missteps that you guys see within this framework? Well, I think you've already hit the big one is that by meeting needs, people, um, will misunderstand or misrepresent that as rewarding yeah. bad behavior, bad behavior. You know, people yeah. really like to say, oh, so you're giving her a treat because she's acting out. Now she's going to act out all the time so she can get a treat. And it's like, oh no, I'm not actually giving her a treat. I'm actually meeting a need right. that her body has to regulate her blood sugar, to make sure that she's not acting out of fear because she has hunger pains. You know, so that is a big one. But, and I, I think that the big part of that that comes up for me is not even um, in meeting the physical needs, but it's that misunderstanding that um, connection is a reward. Yes. That one to me is like when my daughter is dysregulated and I snuggle with her and we connect and regulate that people will call that a reward. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Like this connection is never a reward or, and it's never up for removal. Like that's, that to me is a conversation I've had so many times. It's good. It's good. What about you, Charm? I think it's, it's the same one. Um, it's very easy to, it doesn't require any work at all to push somebody away. Yeah. Um, yeah. And when you then have to regulate and bring them in and meet that need, as you're saying, um, it, it takes a lot of work. And I think for me, like I'm saying, for me, this one, <laughs> it takes a lot out of me because I have to give a lot. And sometimes I'm digging from a place that I, I don't have experience of. Yeah. And so it, it really complicates things sometimes because I'm happy with my needs not being met. I'm okay. <laughs> I was raised that way and, and, and I can do yeah, you fun. really are. Yeah. I, I can, it doesn't bother me, but, yeah. <laughs> but now having to understand the little ones and having to meet their needs, it's yeah. a lot of work on my part. Um, and a lot of the times I think for the longest of time I've had to watch Regina kind of do that and put myself in that place and say, wow, this is actually what yeah. this requires. Yeah. Yeah. And I still get a little resentful here and there because I'm like, okay, this is requiring too much <laughs> for me. <laughs> right. And but I think I think you know sometimes I just have to allow myself to let go and be yeah. in that place. Um, you know, sometimes it's just being there, not saying anything, which yeah. I'm really good at <laughs> not saying anything. <laughs> but. <laughs> Um, so I think that's one is, is, a, is a big one. And because we live in a very cross-cultural uh, place and, and uh, you know, our surroundings, people tend to like look and wonder how that is going. But I think people who are now understanding, people who have connection to us, 
are starting to adapt to some of these to say, wait, needs need to be met. Yeah. Especially by fathers in the homes. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. But I think, yeah. that, you know, the thing that was a huge, uh, I was going to say convincer, that's not necessarily a word. But like one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest things that changed my mind, um, there's still a voice in the back of my head when we were first being introduced to this content. Like, I just, I don't, I don't get getting the kid a snack when they're falling apart. I don't, I don't get rewarding that behavior and having to shift that. You want to keep it away. That's yeah. when you want to hold it back the most. You want to say <laughs> like, right. you can have that when you act right. Like when you, you come back yeah. and fix what you did, <laughs> yes, I'll give you a, you know, an apple or a granola bar. It's like, we're not offering ice cream Sundays for like, you know, <laughs> falling apart. Like we're talking about like nutrient, like things that are going to help you. Yeah. And I think yeah. seeing the science and like the brain science behind, uh, regulation. I, I was talking to a friend a few minutes ago and uh, we were, we just, ah, we had a cat come into our home a couple of weeks ago, um, sort of against my will. And um, we also already have a giant dog that lives in our home. And, um, and so like just the stress of trying, like, you know, who's holding the cat? Like, are we, I, I do not want our kids to have to remember the trauma of a you know, 90 pound dog eating a kitten in our living room, you know, when they're all like, no, pip squeak, what happened? So the, like, I don't want that to happen. So like we, we brought the cat in and we were talking the other day and, uh, she said, you know, it's just like humans, like until there's trust built, that relationship is going to be rocky. And I was like, I can't handle this conversation about a cat and a dog building trust together. But I, I have to say like, I'm, I've got there and started realizing one day, like one of them was hungry at the wrong time. And so like it does, you, you, you see it biologically throughout like creation that like when we, oh, yeah. uh, when we, when our needs are off or unmet, um, it creates fear and fear drives behaviors that we're trying to get away from. And so uh, no matter how we slice it, like the science of the matter yeah. that it's the least effective thing possible for me to ignore the sensory and physical needs and expect the emotional needs to stay intact or stay, or stay met and regulated. And so if I'm going to see a meltdown happening and act like ignoring the needs that are at the root of that misbehavior yeah. or whatever you want to call it, like I'm going to ignore those. I'm actually doing the least effective thing possible to help our kids to long term know how to handle those emotions and to regulate and to um and to own yeah. their things in, in public. And so I think learning the science of it helped me to be less uh philosophical and more just equational. Like, okay, something's yeah. going on here. And instead of thinking like, why do you always do this? You're always driving me crazy. Instead of that, it's all right. It's more like looking at a car. Like, I wonder what it is that's, that's going on with this right now. Like something's not right here. We got to, we got to figure out where the, where the problem is. And so it's helped me to think about that a lot. And I think it, it flipped that from being a misconception to, to now be mm -hmm. a diagnostic tool that we have in our tool belt to, to figure stuff out. Well, and people are scared, like all the yeah. examples you yeah. get being like adults, like adults are scared of like doing the wrong thing. Like, I feel like there's so much pressure on us to do the, to uh, I'm not a parent, but just as an adult that cares for kids, there's so much pressure to be good at it and to like yeah. things that work. To get it right. To get it right. And it's like, you're scared because what if I give them a snack and then they do do this every single day? Like it's that fear yeah. loop that starts to play in your head. And what will other people think of me if they see me giving this kid a hug whenever they're yeah. cussing me out or whatever it is, yeah. like or hitting or whatever the case may be. And so it's like, I think some of it, the misconception, you said it, both of you said it, but it's like, if you don't flip the mindset from kids primarily learn through rewards and punishments, like if you're not willing to let go of that mindset, meeting needs will never make sense to you because you'll always run yeah. everything through that loop. <laughs> so it's like, you really do have to let go of an entire mindset to be able to see it differently yeah. and be like, you know what, when this kid is 32, I want them to be able to recognize that they're hungry and be able yes. to punch and be yes. able to like regulate yeah. themselves. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, Becca, that is exactly it. So much of this is just like fear that we are going to make a decision that is going to mess our kids up. That's going to yes. leave them entitled yeah. or, you know, unable to maneuver the world. But the reality is if, if I, as an adult, I am on Sunday, I will be 44 years old. And if I still struggle to identify my own needs, sometimes I do not want to parent my children in a way that at 44 years old, they're still trying to figure out what their brain and their body and their heart needs. I want them to be able to understand and to be able to mitigate that for themselves. Like I like the fact that my daughters know, oh, it's been two hours and I'm being mean to my sister a little bit. Maybe if we go have a snack together, we're going to play nicer. Like yeah. how much better is our life? Because my yeah. daughters yeah. understand that they start to get grouchy with each other if they if it's been more than two hours since they've had a snack. And again, they're not going, you know, every once in a while they'll push it and they'll ask for an ice cream, but really they're grabbing a piece of fruit or they're grabbing, you know, some lunch meat or some protein, like they understand what makes it easier in their body and what makes it harder in their body. And they are better at that at 19 and eight than I am at 44 because I get like, the truth is I'm a child of trauma. And my first attachment therapist was in when I was in my early twenties. And when I start to get all anxious and antsy and I'm struggling to identify what need is unmet, my cortisol levels send me running for a Coke or a chocolate bar. And yeah. that makes it worse where my daughters at eight and 19, when they start getting antsy and they realize that, that they're overdue for a snack, they reach for something that actually meets their needs. And I yeah. just think that is such a beautiful picture of how this works. And I think in reality, a big misstep that we make is assuming that things are so different in, you know, toddler bodies or little kid bodies or teenager bodies or adult bodies than they were in baby bodies. Yeah. You know, when our kid, when when we have a newborn in our arms and they cry, we don't ask if we're going to spoil them if we meet that need. We feed right. them, we change, right. you know, we right. would be insane when that baby cries to say, "Oh, are we going to mess this up if we meet this need?" But yeah. then all of a sudden, four years down the road or 10 years down the road, when, you know, brain chemistry is flying and friends have hurt their feelings and things are going wrong, we sit there in the cry and we ask ourselves, are we going to mess this up by meeting the need? And I think that's a huge misstep that we as parents stop doing the things that work. Meeting the needs and the distress and delighting them works at every stage. Yes. So good. That's really good. Uh how how do y'all find you? I mean, you answered some of these things, but how do you find yourself using this practice most often right now in your home? Um, so, I, you know, I have a thing I use in my head where when I'm meeting needs, I always tell myself that this is a long-term goal. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's like, it's like a saving. I'm not going to reap the fruits right away. Yeah. So right now I just need to be present and do what I'm doing. And not expect to see the result the next minute. Um, I need that. But in, in, in the, <laughs> you know, but in the long run, um, it you know you start to see those, and with the research that's coming up, and and you starting to learn more, um, because a lot of the times it's very easy to parent with what I call short term goals. You see a problem, fix it, and you carry on uh, without really investing, and I think that actually causes a lot of trauma. So I think for me, it's, it's, it's that way. It's, it's that work to understand and kind of regulate myself in my own head, why I'm doing what I'm doing and what it's for. Um, I think the big one for you right now. So we have our, we have 19 year old and an eight year old. Um, our 19 year old is learning how to drive. Um, and one of the ways hmm. he's meeting the need is by not letting me be a part of that process. <laughs> because, <laughs> I like that structure <laughs> because you can see he is like the calm, steady, yeah. Yeah. stoic one. So yeah. he's got to be the driving instructor. Yeah. Makes sense. Because I'm going to, if I get in the car with my daughter, she's never going to want a driver's license. <laughs> so that's a big one that you're doing is investing that way. I think, um, yeah. we are, we're not in our summertime. We're in our school term and my, um, our eight year old, is one of those kids that is always climbing, jumping, spinning at all times. And so she has had a couple of 
um, big emotional things that have happened at school in the past few weeks. And so at our house after school, you will see her in our frangipani tree doing her homework. You know, she's reading, she's writing, doing her things in the tree. And that is one of the ways, it's one of the most simple, basic ways that we're meeting needs is when she says, I need to go sit in my tree. Can I do my homework up there? I say, absolutely. Yes. Do you want me to bring you a snack? Yeah, that's huge. That is huge. We, it's been interesting as our kids have have learned more about uh, these things. You know, they they all kind of have or or want a spot that they can go that's just for them that they can get. The issue in summer is that one of our kids their their favorite place to do that or to hide out is there's a spot back in the back of the closet where there's like a a little weird turn. We live in a very old house, so nothing makes sense. So like there's a weird turn in the closet, and there's just like a little spot. It's not really big enough for anything except for a human body. <laughs> <laughs> and so it, this part, this one likes getting back there, but the problem is now there's no air conditioning vent in there. And and so, you know, it's in the upstairs, it's like a hundred degrees outside. So like, we got to find different places for that now, but it's, it's fun to watch our kids like begin to even intuit that and, and know something happens, they disappear. And, and formerly I would be like, you cannot run away from this. You got to stand and face it right now. And now I know absolutely get where you need to go for a few minutes, like take a deep breath. Let's wind that and then come back and we'll just, we'll all take that sigh of relief together and then we'll start talking through it. Um, so I love that. The, the, the tree climbing is great. Um, great for that. Um, yeah. Okay. Our, maybe my favorite question in this whole series is uh, what is an example that you've seen of this happening in uh, a movie book or TV show? Oh, I have to go first on this one. Okay. <laughs> I do. I think this is the best question. And I have loved in the other episodes listening to this. Yeah. So this one I think is really tricky with meet the needs because I am pretty convinced that every book, TV show and movie has a really good example of this. It's like the core yeah. conflict and resolution is generally someone understanding the need and meeting it in a new way. Yeah. So I think you can find it everywhere, but I will talk about the big movies that we have been watching recently. So obviously for your summertime, our winter, the movie of the year seems to be Little Mermaid, the live action. I don't know if you guys are all pretty obsessed with this movie, but our household is obsessed. And I think, first of all, so I was in high school when the original Little Mermaid came out and or middle school, something like that, and watched it a million times. So this has been so beautiful for me to watch the live action with my daughters. And that scene at the very end, hopefully it's not a spoiler because everyone knows the story where in the live action, um, Ariel and Prince Eric are in the rowboat and King Triton comes up and just sees Ariel and tells her that he loves her. And then all the mermaids, you know, kind of swim up and, you know, he pushes her off towards the ship in their little rowboat. It is just such a beautiful depiction of this father and daughter who had such conflict Mm -hmm. and just couldn't see each other, couldn't hear each other, you know, and then this moment where he just really saw her and met that need of connection and love and belonging in her family and in her community even though things are different and things have changed. And I just think that that moment is just so precious Um, because I think that is the big need that, that I can sometimes overlook the easiest is that, you know, I can look at the physical needs and I can be really pretty in tune almost to a point of obsession about the sensory needs, but sometimes the connection needs, especially when I am having a busy day or a hard day or am in a moment of dysregulation, I want to overlook the connection needs, the need for belonging, the need to be seen, heard, and valued, because those are harder for me in those moments. It's way easier for me to meet a practical, tangible need than an emotional one in certain moments of the day. And so that moment is really special for me. And then we just watched Clifford, the big red dog. Okay. Um, We really wanted to watch that movie. And that was one of the connection needs I really noticed in that one is that little Emily Elizabeth just did not belong at school. She didn't fit in. You know, people were picking on her. She was the scholarship kid at the private school and she just wanted a pet. JD, you were talking about this, the cat. And we are that family. We have too many dogs. We have too many cats. We have too many chickens because my little one just loves the animals. 
And that moment where she got this little red dog and just felt like that gave her that connection and that sense of belonging. Yeah. And then as he grew into this giant red dog and all the kids were obsessed with him and he was on the news, it was like, oh, that need for belonging and connection has been met. And it is so beautiful. So those were my two favorite examples recently. Yeah. You always go with like the epic movies. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So this was really hard for me Mm. to really pinpoint down a movie that I can say you know, I'd really talked about this. And the one that really stuck out, I don't know if you guys watched Annie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. With with Jamie Foxx. Yeah. I didn't watch yes. the I didn't watch the older one. I watched that one. And um just how he felt his connection was to his wealth, to his money, to his success. Yeah. But all he needed was a little human being uh to give all of all of that up. Um and I just found that beautiful that, you know, that sort of connection can make you forget that you're trying to get to the top of the world and be the wealthiest person if you get the right connection. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that's the movie that really spoke to me. And and just to add on to that, it's it's more, you know, I think the world is adapting more to to physical and emotional needs being met. I think the sensory is still still a little bit at large. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of people still don't don't quite understand that. And, you know, even as I get older now, I'm starting to realize, man, I don't like this. And I'm realizing there's an issue there. <laughs> and every 100%. every food place I go to, I'm always going to the, where's the manager? Can you guys reduce your volume? <laughs> you know, but everyone else is not bothered by it. Uh, yeah. And, and but I feel like the world is not fully, you know, hasn't really caught up to, to that third one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I feel the same way. I mean, that yeah. our, our youngest has a lot of sensory needs and there are times that, I mean, we, at this stage, we're not to the point of going to talk to me. I, we just, we divide and conquer. One of us stays home. We're like, Oh, we're going there. Oh, it's always so loud. Hold on. We're, one of us will go yeah. and the other, we can stay here and figure that out. Um, I always feel like I need to give this, the, the, the uh, disclaimer that I'm not wholeheartedly endorsing every single thing that's in any show or movie that I talk about. But <laughs> sure. This one I'm pretty close to. There's some language that is definitely more adult, but there's a show called Primo and it's on Amazon, uh, Amazon Plus. It's my favorite writer um, uh, of of books, like wrote this TV show kind of about his upbringing. And there is a, there's a scene, there's a lot of scenes where this is, is like front and center. Um, but there is, there's one in particular, I, I got it without spoiling things. Um where the the premise is it's a kid it's it follows a kid and his single mom and then his five uncles who are all way too involved in his life and it's it's funny and it's sweet it's very much like a sitcom um but uh definitely heavier on like family togetherness and connection and meaning and all that and so of course like because it's a tv show like there's very distinct personalities in all the uncles and so um one his is more hippie one is more like in and out of jail every now and then uh one was an army guy one works in a bank and you know so there's just all kind of uh, one is a landscaper and so like there's a there's a, a particular episode where they're all arguing over what Primo, who that is the Spanish word for nephew, like what their nephew should do uh, to impress this girl. And each of them is giving all of their unique advice. And one of them is like, no, you need to pick the biggest guy in the school and wait till she's in the room and you just go punch him right in the face. You just you just hit him as hard as you can and show you have to show her you can protect her. And the other one is like, that's ridiculous. You're going to get suspended for that. No, to show you protect her, you get out and you work. And I'm, I'm working near the school this week. I'll put you on my crew. I'll let you carry some really heavy stuff and you'll show her that you can provide for her and you can take care. And they one by one give all their advice. And the mom is just sitting in the back like this. And the mom had had sort of raised the brothers as they were all growing up and so she she looks back and she said do not ask any of them for advice ever again like here and so she connects them to say like you have a unique makeup and you're going to do things you're, you're on your own way um and so it's a funny and like the it ends up in, the, in that episode kind of coming around to show that they were all like sharing with him hey here's my advice but we support you no matter what. And we've got your back and we're going to be here for you. And that like emotional security ends up like as the show goes on, like 
really propelling him. And so it's, I would say for, for almost any family, I mean, it's definitely more of a mom and dad show than it is for kids, but like, uh, but it is, we, we have loved it. And there's a lot of great, like rich stuff in there for us, I think to use this example. You have to watch it. Yeah, I haven't heard of it, but we're gonna watch it. I haven't heard of it either. It's eight episodes. They're like twenty five minutes a piece. There, it it yeah. just got uh, certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, which means it has to have like a certain number of ratings over a hundred percent. And so, like, it's it's really, I think it's really great. If you hate it, um, it was Becca's idea. <laughs> <laughs> Becca, who's never heard of it, I uh, I was thinking about a book that I read when I was a kid, The Giver. I really liked that book oh. by Lois Lowry, yeah. and the premise of The Giver is that they're like in a futuristic society where they've suppressed all their needs, all their emotional needs. Like everything is like calm and sameness. It's like, it's like a very like kind of dystopian future novel. And the idea is like, well, they've suppressed all this. And so like, yeah, they don't feel as much pain, but also they can't feel joy. And so I think sometimes when thinking about like meeting emotional needs, like we get scared of the of the like hard or sad feelings. Yeah. And so that book yeah. illustrates, obviously it's like to an extreme level on purpose to make a point, yeah. but kind of the point is yeah. if you suppress everything and if you just want conformity, if you just want everything to be the same, you're going to miss out on a lot of joy and like a lot of life that you can have with other people and with creativity. And yeah. so it's just, one, it's one of my favorite books. And when I was thinking about the meet needs episode, I was like, that really is kind of about the idea of like, if we ignore emotional needs, what could happen mm-hmm. in like a fake future world? Yes. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, well, I feel like that, you know, there's a thousand examples we can use mm-hmm. um, in here. I, I do think of the movie Inside Out also. Um, oh, yes. Pixar movie. I mean, it's a, it's a, yeah, that's a good one. Like very blatant outward, yeah, like entire for sure. this explicit purpose. Um, and so I think about that all the time. It's a good my wife and I a lot of times will kind of will like do this little motion to remind each other that there's uh brains on fire when, yep. <laughs> when there's this regulation happening to remind us not to react like sincerely yes. to things that are being said or done, but to remember like, oh, we gotta calm this down. Um yep. this is a good one. Um well guys. Any any last kind of words of advice or or um, things that you want to share with people, maybe that are that are just being introduced to these principles? Go ahead. Um, I, I, I mean, I guess my words of advice would be to, if you are new to this, to be compassionate with yourself and to be gentle with yourself. That you know. It, it is really easy to identify the behaviors that we don't like and that we want to get rid of. That part is really easy. Mm-hmm. And at the very beginning, when someone asks you, okay, so what's the underlying need behind that behavior? It can feel like your mind goes blank. Like what need yeah. could possibly yeah. be driving this? Mm-hmm. You know, it can feel so annoying. <laughs> to be asked that question. But the longer you stick with this and and the longer you you stick with just the real basics. You know, are we meeting the physical needs? In this moment, are we meeting the connecting needs? Are we, you know, the attachment needs? Are we meeting the sensory needs? The the more you go through that checklist and you start to see the behaviors dissipate, it becomes easier to identify the need that's driving the behavior. And it is a beautiful thing when you realize that when needs are met, behaviors are pretty calm, connected, and regulated. They really are. And when needs are unmet, the behaviors can get pretty wild and wonky. And when you start to be able to identify those faster and meet those ahead of time so that those behaviors start to not pop up, it just feels so relieving, I think, to to be able to see that you can make an impact. So I would say be compassionate with yourself. Um, Invite trusted people into the conversation to say, help me figure out what this need is until I can do this for myself. Um, And don't think that unmet needs mean that you are doing something wrong. Right. Right. That is the biggest thing is that when my kids needs are unmet, when I pick my daughter up from school and she has a meltdown before her seatbelt is even on, that is not an indictment on my parenting. Yeah. What that means is that she may have been holding that in for a day, an hour, 10 minutes. And what it means is that we are close enough. She feels safe enough with me that she can give me that meltdown because she trusts me 
to help meet the needs in that moment. And so often it can feel like these big baffling behaviors are an indictment on our parenting. And that is not at all what they are. Yeah. hundred percent. So good. Well, um, I think similar to what you said, I think for me, it's more on a personal level that, you know, learn to meet your needs. Um, and if you don't know how, find someone that can help you to do that. Uh, because the world needs us to be healthy and when, yeah. and, you know, meeting yeah. needs can, you have to meet them in a healthy way. I don't mean it in a selfish way because people might say, well, I'm going to meet my need. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> um, but I, I mean in a healthy way and and find people who, trusted people who can show you and help you to be able to do that because, you know, the world needs you to be healthy and also meet others, meet other people's needs, people that are close to you. Um, and I think if we, we live in a world where we are able to identify and be compassionate and be able to meet each other's needs in our families, in our workplaces, we'll be in a much uh, healthier world. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> I think that's great advice. Yeah. Um, yeah. Guys, thank you so much for joining us today, for making time. And um, and we look forward to talking to you. Now Now that you've been on once, we, we've got to have you on again. So we'll <laughs> make sure. Oh, it's so fun. It's always such a joy, Becca, to be with you. And yes. JD, thank you so much for this. It was a real pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. Thank you guys so much. Well. I hope that you got as much out of that as I did. Um, you know, one thing that it continues to come up uh, over and over again in our our shows as a theme is just that it does start with us um, as parents when it comes to um, figuring out what's going on. You know, if we can take care of ourselves well, um, it lends ourselves to being able to take care of our kids well. If we don't know how to take care of ourselves well, um, it is more difficult to teach our, our kids how to do that. And um, I thought Regina made a beautiful point in just saying that um, we, or Becca did, I mean, we, we want to teach our kids how to be able to do this at 32 not just at two or five or eight or whatever. Um, and so the goal again with um, meeting needs is teaching our kids how to meet needs for their own lifetime, like how to meet their own needs and how to teach their kids to meet their needs uh, generationally and so on and so on. So uh, for us to do that, and Yasha pointed out pretty, pretty potently, like we've got to do that ourselves. We've got to take care of ourselves, got to meet our own emotional needs. We've got to meet our own physical needs, our own sensory needs. And so um, just thought that was a great reminder. It was one that I needed today. And so uh, really grateful for them joining us today um, and excited about what they've got going on down in Zimbabwe. So uh, that's all we've got for today's show. We will continue our series next week. We're excited to be with you uh, again and have a great episode coming your way. And so uh, until then, for Kyle Wright, who edits and engineers all of our audio, for Tad Jewett, who's the creator of the music behind the Empowered to Connect podcast, I'm J.D. Wilson, and we will see you next week on the Empowered to Connect podcast. <laughs>